welcome everyone to the April 3rd, 2020 community forum call. We are, um, we are really excited to have uh, everyone back for our second community forum. And so before I uh, introduce today's uh, member, fellow member who's gonna be doing the report from the field, I wanna go back to last week and just once again, appreciate Andy Eby for being our kickoff speaker uh, in offering his report from the field, hashtag offense. And many of you will, um, will remember from either the live experience or on the recording that Andy talked about this move from defense to offense, this move from getting out of being the victim where life was happening to us and almost frozen out of fear into an offensive position to create value and make a difference. So we have, um, we have an opportunity to continue to stay grounded in last week's big message. And the message last week was the recognition that most people right now are coping. They're trying to cope and they're coping from often a place of fear. And what we do not need right now is coping. Okay, that's not what we need. What we need are growth strategies, not coping strategies, especially from leaders. And so in today's call, you're gonna hear about some growth strategies from our, uh, from our speaker. And so we have, I would suggest a responsibility. I would suggest an obligation as leaders to stay awake right now, to stay as aware as we can, and to realize it's not what happens in our, in, our, in our markets, with our teams, what's happening in the world. It's not what happens, it's how we relate to what happens. And so this idea of leadership being a form of learning how to relate. And the one thing that really I really wanna emphasize before I introduce our speaker is that a lot of leaders are telling us on the Stegen team and calling me and saying, um, I'm pushing away some of the feelings I'm having because as a leader, we need to have a we need to we need to armor up and we need to have a strong position to what's going on right now we're in a crisis and we would actually say that it's important to first feel what's happening for you and so i'll model this this morning our chairman rick Vorin, uncle rick he called and said how are you doing and i gave him the the habitual response i'm doing great i'm exercising i'm staying strong i'm staying focused and then he he asked me again how are you doing and I, I took a breath and I said, you know, I am do I'm doing well. And yesterday I had a few moments, a few moments where I felt despair. Just they were they were ever so brief. And I felt like overwhelmed. I read a news article, I, I heard something on on uh, on CNN, and I just felt despair. And then I was able to reconnect with something more positive. And so the Stockdale paradox, which I think most of us are familiar with is that we need to confront the brutal reality of today. And the brutal reality is we are all gonna feel despair and overwhelm and fear at times. So how do we actually honor that? How do we actually feel and experience that and simultaneously have an unwavering faith that we will together get on the other side of this? So how do we hold both of those dynamics where we can feel the experience that, that others are feeling and not push that away, not deny that, not avoid that, but feel that and simultaneously have a sense of vision and have a sense of confidence for the future. So this, this, this last thing I'll say is we're seeing a lot of people behave in ways that I'm just gonna give the benefit of the doubt are well-intentioned. I'm seeing, and I think most of us are, a lot of opportunistic efforts to make money right now. And this like, we've got to find ways to turn the crisis into a opportunity. And, and I would challenge all of us to see this moment, this leadership moment, not as a moment to extract, but as a moment to serve. Not as a moment to be opportunistic, but as an opportunity to be in relationship. And so this move, which I believe is a is a really a beautiful bridge to our speaker, is something that I uh, I have watched this leader Sean McGinnis live for the last 25 years. Sean has been a member at the Stegen Leadership Academy since 2002. He is the president of Young Presidents Organization, and as you may have seen in the introduction uh, email, 
Uh, Sean is responsible for over 350 employees, team members at Young Presidents Organization, and he is rallying them and leading them to serve their 30,000 members in over 130 countries around the world. And so this is a leader who is in the action, Scott McIntosh, the arena. Sean is in the arena, and he is going to be talking to us not about uh, theory. He's going to be talking of what he and his team are doing, working together to serve 30,000 of their key stakeholders, their key members, and other stakeholders. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. That's how I start all my calls, because we have team members literally around the world. And uh, Rand, wow. Um, there was so much to unpack in, in your preamble. And um, it reminds me very, very clearly of the article you sent around the Peter Kustenbaum article. And starting out today, I thought I'd share with you a little bit of a nugget that came out to me from that article. And I know many of you are feeling this, but he said, anxiety makes you grow up. Anxiety is the experience of growth itself. And in any endeavor, how do you feel when you go from one stage to next, to the next? You feel anxious, you feel fearful. Um, and if you don't embrace it, Kastenbaum says, you know, you can get ill, you shut down. Um, it impacts your ability to be joyful, to be centered. Um, and his practical formula is go where the pain is. And I was very struck with that. Um, and I'll take you back uh, to the first week of March this year. Uh, I was sitting in San Diego um, and we were about to receive 3,000 CEOs uh, from around the world, 150 coming from South Korea that was just going through a massive meltdown with the coronavirus, about 80 from um, the Wuhan province and, and mainland China, uh, 45 from Italy, um, and we made a decision, and from around the world, but we made a decision, um, a very early stage decision to cancel um, the most important event uh, that we run every year. Now, you can imagine the difficulty associated with that. Put yourself in, in this mindset. We're a nonprofit organization. This is our biggest investment of the year in excess of $7 million. Um, and we're, um, this is the place where people connect on a very intimate level. Uh, and, they, and this gives them a boost for, um, for the year ahead. And there's so many other benefits and values that come from it. So imagine sitting in a room and having to go through um, some very, very difficult, but very profoundly growth oriented conversations, different points of view, uh, different orientations to risk, different orientations to money, and different orientations to what would happen if just one individual came from an infected environment and that then spread to 3,000, which then would cascade and multiply. So we ultimately made a decision um, not to go forward. And then we spent the next uh, week in San Diego unwinding from two years of preparation. These take two years to prepare. And what you learn about yourself, and this is another cost, uh, uh, Kustenbaum insight, is you first need to look at yourself. You need to look very carefully. And I did this a lot. I went to, I went to my room at about three o'clock one afternoon, I lay down because I just couldn't think anymore. I couldn't function um, mentally and tactically. And I'm an extremely tactical person. Um, and an hour just with some reflection and breathing and, you know, with my shoes off on the bed, I then got up and went back into the fray. That's what it required. But I was able to center in, what do I value? How are my people going to feel? How are my, how are my members going to feel? And how do I, with all my idiosyncrasies, how do I respond as a leader? And so for me, what became very clear was that it wasn't about me. And it was in my leadership role, it was about listening and meeting people where they were at. So we started to delve into, and we did this as a board and we did this as a team. When we having conversations and every conversation now we start out this way. And those of you that are in YPO and forum, I hope, you, I hope you, you've been using this technique in, in your meetings. But it literally is about hearing and having every voice heard at the start of every conversation. Not, difficult, not easy to do in a Zoom call of 196 people now. But I, look, I, I start by asking four things. And our team's doing the same. Our board is doing the same. 
The first thing is, how are you? How are you at an individual level? How's your family? Because we're all sequestered with our families right now. And even those of us that are sequestered alone, we have our extended friendships, our extended communities, our extended families. The third question, and these are all done at the same time, round robin style, are you taking care of yourself? And the fourth, are you in need of any specific resource? And how can I, as your leader, help to make, think, make things easier for you? Four very simple, very simple questions. And in a small group setting, in your team settings, your core leadership group settings, starting out that way and literally going around the Zoom, around the squares, and having everybody just center in those uh, questions, has, I've, uh, it's just been profound. People are open, they open themselves, they share little tips and techniques, they share their little, you know, their, their secrets. Um, hey, you know, I'm wearing a pair of shorts today, I hope you see my nice, <laughs> my nice shirt. Um, and then you hear the deeper stuff, like, you know, I've got three kids, um, you know, one of whom has learning difficulties and trying to get them set up for their daily lesson plan and to help them through while I'm expected to do my work for the day is extraordinarily difficult. And how do you make space for that person to be effective, not only in their lives, but in their contribution to your business? So setting that initial frame has been very powerful for us. And I have learned a great deal about stepping back and allowing time for people to have their voices heard. That's a big, big learning for me. Because as leaders, we wanna jump straight to solutioning. We wanna, and I, by the way, I loved Andy's session next week. And I went, I had a team call directly afterwards and I used the hashtag offense call to action. But hashtag offense and tactics and um, the, the hard nub of business can only occur when people are willing to receive and I want to be real clear with you from my own experience. If people are not in a receptive mindset, they are not going to be able to act effectively. So how do you, con how do you create conditions that the individuals that you're working with and that are relying on your leadership have the mindset, the space, the resources, and the mental conditions to handle what you're asking them to do? So that has been an evolving set of experiences and lessons as the last three weeks have unfolded. So what we've done and, and what I'm leading at YPO is I've, I've got a two-pronged strategy. I've got what I call our nerve center. And our nerve center is what would typically be your senior leadership team. It's operations, it's finance, it's governance, um, it's business continuity, um, it's human resources. And we have a, we, we have a group um, that literally is there Take the, you know, Rand, you use the inverted pyramid a lot, uh, or you used to in a lot of the, the work. It's the, the real work is happening at the top of the pyramid where all of the day-to-day -day actions, the client interface, the vendor interface, the negotiation interface, the service interface happens. At the bottom of the pyramid, I've structured now a nerve center that's strictly focused on support. It's clearing obstacles, it's dealing with ex escalations, and it's making decisions happen much more quickly. Think of it in, in terms of an agile mindset where you, know, you have to make a lot quicker decisions with the, best, uh, with the best minds at the table. So I've got a small nerve center group. And then I've created, and you know, we're extremely blessed to have a, a new member of our team that has been running Fashion Week in New York for the last seven years. And we hired her as a as an executive director for our big annual program. Now that we don't have an annual program, I'm able to leverage her skill set. And so she's a, just a, a, an executive director par excellence. Think of it in terms of a movie producer and an and a, uh, you know, executive producer. She really is a great director, air traffic controller. So we've created literally a COVID-19 current acute state response team and all of the regular departments are now having to adapt and be, um, be in conversation and literally take direction from that team. We've got that up and, up and running in two weeks. It's messy. It's not ideal. We're getting a lot of complaints. We're getting a lot of sidebar conversations. Those are my job as a leader to deal with and remove the, uh, and remove the, the noise out of the system. I think next week it's going to really get well oiled. It's remarkable also for me, having set this process up, 
how people have stood up, how they've embraced, um, you know, the accountability and how they are, uh, you know, rising to the occasion. A couple of things that's made that work. Communicate, over-communicate, and over-communicate. In an authentic way, I just did a video yesterday to the entire organization, for example, and I started out with the preamble to uh, Star Trek, you know, Stardate 4, 2, 2020. You know, our mission is to go where nobody else has gone before. You know, we are going to, you know, and I, I, I can share it with you and I made, made it sort of really interesting. And then I created a mission uh, framework to articulate the clarity, the meaning, and why it's important for everybody to step up, not telling people what to do, but creating a frame that they can then anchor to. Because in this time, none of us have ever been through this before. I haven't. Four years ago, we started a uh, crisis activity response team at YPO to deal with the inevitable reality of an incident at an event. You know, somebody gets kidnapped, you know, building goes down. Uh, you know, your kids are in Austria and, you know, the zip line collapses. So we had that in place, but nobody prepared us for this. That was helpful. And then secondly, I think uh, on my main uh, talking points today, I wanted to take you through what we're doing in terms of what I'm calling now through to next. So now in, in the context of our customer, our customers are members, CEOs that are running you know, businesses around the world, some of whom have had no revenue for the past two weeks, some of whom are, you know, looking at, uh, at environments in certain parts of the world that this is not going to be anything like um, what they've had to deal with. And it certainly is going to be a lot of crisis management going forward. And so I've anchored my team in, in four key things, and I'll describe what we're doing tactically in, in, in a moment. The questions that we're asking is, and we're asking ourselves, is what is the nature of our customer relationships today? Were they good? Were they somewhat good? Were they in pockets great? What is the nature of our customer relationship today? And getting answers to those questions. The second is, what are the regular customer problems? What are the regular member problems that we've been solving? What, is the, what was the core of our business? What were the things that we were doing most often that members were telling us were value to them. In my context, it was connecting peer to peer and in being involved in a forum environment. So if those are still true today in crisis, what can we be doing to make sure that access to those tools and techniques, that people are meeting in their forums, that they're using Zoom to connect, whereas before they were doing it in person. The third one is, do we have a current customer relationship strategy. Rand said that in his preamble, and it was woven through his comments. Because at this time, my belief and my current experience is it's all about relationships. It's relying on the deposits we've been making in each other for the last 20 years. And not only you know uh, relying on them for contribution to us, relying on our ability to contribute back into the communities and into those people we're working with. So what is your current relationship and strategy. And then the final one is thinking a little bit about the future. What role does you, do you, your future brand as a leader, and what role does your organizational brand play in a changed world? Please think about this. What are you going to look like and how are you going to be regarded when you, we come out of this, when we come through that tunnel? What role should your brand play personally, and from a corporate standpoint in a changed world. So those are, the, those are some of the big, very anchoring uh, questions that we're focused on. And then, you know, we've got a series of, of techniques that we're doing to do that. Our biggest one starting today is we're doing, we're calling, we have 80 team members, eight zero of my 350 people, six weeks, four hours a day, each person, we're gonna call all 30,000 members. All 30,000 members will get a 20 minute individual call, three questions. How are you? What resources do you need? And how can I immediately help you? And we're gonna capture that data and we're gonna to respond to it. That is something we have never done before. 
you can you imagine getting that approved through a bureaucratic organization or you know through different structures and you know trying to get those trying to get those things ramped up we put out on tuesday a request all, well, I would say 95% of our, our employee base all volunteered to make the calls. We had to pick 80. <laughs> so, you know, you talk, about, um, you talk about an opportunity. You talk about, um, you know, working through crisis. You talk about, um, you know, going where the pain is. We're, we're all living it. Um, those are my initial remarks. I'll leave, you with, um, I'll leave you with something that Rand and I played with um, many years ago, gosh, Rand, it must be 15 years ago in Denver, Colorado. And what's, what, what I do every single day is a meta meditation. You know, may we all be filled with love and kindness. May we all be peaceful and at ease. May we all be free of suffering. And may we all be happy. I wish that for you and all your teams. Oh, Sean, thank you so much, especially the way that you that you uh, closed your segment with the intention setting. And I, uh, I want to really appreciate the, the surfacing that you just did on this on this one idea of relationship. And I and on your questions, what is our current customer relationship strategy? Talk about this idea of relationship. How are you proactively relating or what can you do to more proactively relate with your customers? And I wanna, I wanna emphasize this. This is not a time to extract. This is not a time to extract and watch all the opportunistic businesses that are trying to extract. This is a time to serve. This is a time to be in relationship. This, this is a time to plant those seeds and continue watering those seeds because when we come out the other side, those relationships will be stronger than they've ever been. What, what I was reminded of is this idea that what's, what's in the way is the way, right? What's in the way is the way. The obstacle is the way. So how do we actually just surrender to our resistance to surrender to our need to cope, just stay in that sense of anxiety. And, and it sounds counterintuitive, but how can we find a peacefulness in the anxiety? How can we find a peacefulness by leaning into the obstacle itself just to feel fully alive and not be denying and not be, and not be trying to push away feelings but to embrace those feelings and then to use that source of aliveness and that source of energy as a way to lead ourselves and our teams and our stakeholders into the future by serving and by being in relationship. And so Peter Kastenbaum, anxiety makes you a grown up. Anxiety is the experience of growth itself. In any endeavor, how do you feel when you go from one stage to the next? The answer, you feel anxious. Anxiety that is denied makes us ill. Anxiety that is fully confronted and fully lived through converts itself into joy, security, strength, centeredness, and character. The practical formula, go where the pain is. So Sean, my friend, love to you. May you be filled with love and kindness. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be free of suffering. May you be happy. And the same to all of us. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thanks for all your kind notes.